Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you all. I began my career with a simple question. Why is it that some people are more vulnerable to life's slings and arrows than others? And I studied the brain mechanisms in the early part of my career. I studied the brain mechanisms uh, of why some people are more vulnerable to adversity, to depression, to fear, to stress. And then my life changed very dramatically in 1992. And what happened in 1992 is that I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, this is a picture of the Dalai Lama uh, 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 in our laboratory. And if we can get the slides on this monitor so I can see them too, that would be great. Um, uh, I first met the Dalai Lama in 1992, and he asked me a simple question at that time. He said, why can't we use the same tools of modern neuroscience that we had been using to study stress and anxiety and adversity uh, and study kindness and study compassion? And I didn't have a very good answer for His Holiness on that day, other than that it's hard. But, you know, when we first began to study fear and anxiety, that was hard too, and I think most scientists would agree we've made a little bit of progress. And that was a really important wake-up call for me. And then a few years later, when I saw him again, he was more direct, and he said, please take the practices from my tradition, turn them into a form that anybody would feel comfortable practicing, investigate them with the tools of modern science, and if you find them to be valuable, disseminate them widely. That is my assignment for the remainder of my time on this planet, and it is why I'm here. There is an urgent need today, the crisis of well-being and its devastating and interdependent consequences is not something I need to review for this audience. But well-being really matters, and our well-being is in rapid decline. These are data, just a, a, one of many, many points of data that I can refer to to illustrate how well-being matters. This is, uh, these are data from 151 countries looking at the relationship between well-being in that country and life expectancy. And you can see that there's a very tight correlation so that those countries that enjoy higher levels of well-being have higher life expectancy. Well-being gets under the skin and has dramatic consequences for our health and many other aspects of our lives. Now, I want to start with the World Health Organization's definition of health, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In the United States, we have this entity called the National Institutes of Health, which is a great entity. It's the world's largest funder of biomedical research in the world, but it's misnamed. It's not the National Institutes of Health. It's the National Institutes of Illness. We need a renewed emphasis on health. Health is not simply the absence of illness. And mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. These are definitions from the World Health Organization. Now, there's a lot of challenge today. The news in the world is terrible in so many different areas, from climate change to systemic racism and more. It's important to recognize, though, when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech in the 1960s, the title was not, I Have a Nightmare.
We need to envision the possibility of living in a different way. And the imagination is going to be a key driver and guide us in how to live differently. We've come to this very simple conclusion, but one that we think is quite radical. And that is that well-being is a skill that can be learned. We humans are born to flourish. We have the innate capacity to flourish. Not only do we have the capacity, but every human being has the right to flourish. And what science teaches us is that the very same mechanisms that encode suffering, including neuroplasticity and epigenetics, are the, are the mechanisms that can be harnessed for the good and that can be used to produce awakening and liberation. These same basic mechanisms. And this is what the science is teaching us. So what contributes to resilience and flourishing? we have developed a framework for understanding the key pillars of well-being. We've asked in this wonderful meeting, what is well-being? Well, I will offer one template for its understanding. So this is a framework that we published a couple of years ago uh, in an article that we titled The Plasticity of Well-Being. And that is meant to emphasize the constituents of well-being that science shows us can actually be transformed. So what are the four key pillars of well-being? The first pillar we call awareness. And awareness is our capacity to deploy our attention, a capacity that every human being has to some or more extent. It includes our capacity to know what our minds are doing. This is a capacity that we scientists call meta-awareness. How many of you know what your minds are doing right now? That's pretty good. How many of you have ever had the experience of reading a book where you read each word on a page? And you might read one page, you might read a second page, and after a few minutes you have no friggin' idea what you've just read. Your mind is lost. <laughs> the moment, the moment you recognize that is a moment of meta-awareness. It turns out that meta-awareness is absolutely essential for all other forms of human transformation. And it can be learned. The second pillar of well-being is connection. It's about feeling connected, and it includes the qualities which are critical for healthy social relationships. Qualities like appreciation and kindness and gratitude. The third pillar of well-being we call insight. Insight is about getting curious about how our minds work and particularly self-knowledge, literally knowledge of the self. We all carry around a narrative about ourselves. This is what humans do. We create these narratives. And one of the essential elements of well-being is not so much changing this narrative, but it's changing our relationship to this narrative so that we can understand that when we See, the world, literally, our perception is defined and constrained by this narrative. And when we have insight into that, it can liberate us from the shackles that are imposed by such a narrative. And finally, the last pillar of well-being is purpose. And purpose here is finding our sense of direction, clarifying our values. And it's not so much 
finding something more purposeful to do with our lives, but rather how can we find meaning and purpose in that which we already do, including the activities of daily life that we might think of as pedestrian, can taking out the garbage be centrally connected to your sense of purpose? Can washing the dishes be centrally connected to your sense of purpose? Can everything be connected to your sense of purpose? Absolutely. No doubt about it. But for many of us, it requires training. So I'm going to now take a, a deeper dive into a few of these pillars. And I'll start with awareness. This is William James that I just showed you. In 1890, he wrote this two-volume tome, The Principles of Psychology. Uh, I was a student, a graduate student at Harvard working in William James Hall. Remarkably, I wasn't assigned a single page of William James as a graduate student. Fortunately, I found the principles of psychology. This is what he said in his chapter on attention. The faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compost sui if he have it not. And education, which should improve this faculty, would be the education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. If William James had more contact with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that if there's one thing these traditions do is that they educate attention. This is just a photograph taken in our lab of a very famous young Tibetan Lama, Mingyur Rinpoche, who at the time we tested him based on a very careful, structured interview that we did with him, had 62,000 hours of formal meditation practice. You can go do the arithmetic at home, but trust me, 62,000 hours is a big number. <laughs> and we measured his brain, because if we didn't see differences in his brain, we weren't going to see differences in mere beginners. And sure enough, his brain was dramatically different uh, these are gamma oscillations that we see with the naked eye, which we almost never are able to see, that are present not only during meditation, but also they are present in much greater density during the normal waking state, and they have something to do with this widened aperture of awareness that these practitioners reportedly have. And one thing to know about aperture of awareness is fear contracts the aperture of awareness and love expands the aperture of awareness. Connection. Just very briefly, it doesn't take much. We did a randomized control trial, the kind of gold standard of modern, uh, rigorous scientific research to test whether short-term compassion training, where a person brings into their mind another individual and wishes that they be free of suffering and that they be happy. Uh, and it's a very simple practice. I know many of you in the audience have done and do that practice. And we did this for two weeks, 30 minutes a day, a total of seven hours of practice among rank beginners, and we see that those who are assigned to the compassion group show more pro-social behavior, and I don't have time to go into how we measure that, but this is using rigorous behavioral measures, and their brains completely change in two weeks. These are beginners. Seven hours of practice, all it takes. Now, it's not to say that these changes will stick, if you go to the gym and work out for two weeks and then stop exercising, will the benefits stick? Of course not. These are meant to be lifelong practices. Insight, this curiosity-driven exploration of the self, 
is really a key to resilience. And one of the things that we have found is that people vary in how fast they recover from adversity. So let's take two people. This is person A and person B. They both reach the same amplitude. And it could be on any measure. We've done this with many different measures. It could be a stress hormone. It could be measures in circuitry in the brain. But they recover at different rates. The faster recovery is a marker of resilience. And this is something that could be taught. And finally, purpose, it turns out, is the most important psychological predictor of longevity of any psychological characteristic that's been studied. And these are some data that show that. So we've been interested in how to scale well-being. We've developed the Healthy Minds program, which is based on these four pillars of well-being. We've put it into an app, which is freely available, completely free. And we're very happy that the New York Times uh, in a uh, New York Times wire cutter in a review that they did of meditation apps for 2022, they named this one as being in the top three and the only one that's completely free. So please try it. Uh, these are just some uh, screenshots. We've done randomized controlled trials showing that this actually works. So let me just end by saying the cultivation of well-being is an urgent public health need. When human beings first evolved, none of us were brushing our teeth. I'm sure every one of you in this audience spends a few minutes every day brushing your teeth. If we spent even as short a time as we do brushing our teeth, nourishing our mind, this world would be a different place. Thank you. Let me just end by reading this one quote from the Dalai Lama. This was from a book that was on the bestseller list. The systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you very much. Thank you.